This is an interesting little clock by Joseph Nibb. It was made shortly after he left Oxford and came down to take over Samuel Nibb's workshop in London. And to me, it's a bit of an enigma for two reasons. The first reason is that it's a full grand sonnery clock. There appears to be only two clocks made by Fromentiel, uh, full grand sonnery, which appear before this one. And so this is quite a departure from Joseph Nibb's previous production, which tended only to be weight-driven clocks in Oxford. He comes down, takes over Samuel's workshop, produces a few clocks, which I think were in, in production in the workshop, and then appears to have made this clock here. The second reason why it's an enigma to me is that it abandons the principle of using a fusee to keep an equal drive onto the pendulum. Huygens tried to get over the unequal drive by having cycloidal cheeks, but the drive from a spring can vary by a factor of four or five to one. Uh, when it's fully wound, it gives uh, four or five times the power than it does when it's almost run out. And so that this clock doesn't have a fusee and it doesn't um, have cycloidal cheeks on the going train. So it's a bit of an enigma. And what's even worse, the same spring which drives the uh, going train also drives the quarter train. So it's an absolute nightmare. If you let it run down, the, the spring has enough energy to keep the pendulum swinging, but not to start the quarters properly. And so that the clock keeps going and gets completely out of phase. Uh, and then it's about a three hour job to get it back into phase again. So the little clock itself is the smallest phase one nib. Um, and not only that, it's a full grand sonnery. So that he's packed into the small space here, um, a very interesting, important, striking method. And it's so packed in that on the sides, the bell clappers are coming outside the side of the case. So we have to have these extensions on the side of the case to allow the bell clapper to come out. So it's quite an interesting little clock. The carrying handle must have been one of the simplest handles that uh, ever graced a nib clock. Um, it's just quiet simplicity and does its job. So the dial is beautifully engraved with the Tudor rose in the middle, uh, but it's very small in comparison with a normal phase one nib. Joseph Nib is known for the beauty of his hands. And look at this for a beautiful hour hand, the swirls, uh, it's just beautiful. And here's the signature on the bottom of the dial. Joseph Nib, Londini, fake it. Of course, there are no J's in a Roman alphabet, so J is replaced by I. The fret to let the sound out at the top and the slot with the bells just behind to let out the full grand sonnery sound. So I've turned the clock round and we can have a look at the back plate. Beautiful floral engraving and you've got the little quarter count wheel here with the trip lever going across to lift and set off the grand sonnery great wheel here. So it strikes four times the hour every hour. Incredible. <laughs> 
requirement from the, from the spring. But this spring then has a fusee on it so that it gives pretty well the same rate of striking when it's fully wound and when it's running out. Whereas the twin barrel driving the, the going train and the quarter train, it strikes bing, bing, bing very fast when it has been fully wound. But uh, towards the end of the 30 hours, the duration of the clock, it's very labored until the strike itself stops and the clock keeps going, getting completely out of phase. It's a nightmare. We're looking at the pinwheel above the twin barrel, which drives the quarters. One, two, three, four. So it's four quarters for the hour to strike now. This is the hour train, and you can see the fusee driving it. Um, it's only just strong enough and the fly is slowing down as the force increases to lift the bell hammer. When the bell goes, uh, the fly increases again. You can see the pins, each one lifting the bell arbor across. Uh, the increase in tension from the spring on the right, slowing down the fly and then slipping off and releasing it. And you can even see the wear on the pins after 350 years of hard work. So we've got the beautiful back plate here, these wonderful swirls of flowers and this bold signature all the way across the bottom, uh, Joseph Nib, Londini, fake it. Joseph Nib of London made it. And you can see the grand sonnery mechanism here. The quarter striking is controlled by this quarter wheel and then there are four pins on it. So after it's struck the quarter, it lifts this trip lever, which lifts the lock lever here, and it will then sound the next hour. So coming up to half past six, watch first of all the quarter strike two for the two quarters, half past, and then the hour uh, counted out on the big rotary count wheel on the right hand side. Very measured, isn't it? And there the lock lever then drops into the slot and locks the, the count wheel and the mechanism for the next time. So here's the lock lever for the quarters and here's the locking lever for the hours and here's the trip lever in between the two. So when we set the clock off, it will strike the three quarters and the pin will come round, lift the lift lever and set off the six o'clock. So here we go. Three quarters past six. lock lever is dropped in and the strike is finished.